and it's 1 p.m. on the dot. And so I would like to welcome everyone to today's uh, event on operational security, uh, where we're gonna uh, learn about some practical tools, tips and tricks to stay safer online. Uh, my name is Dominika Luzar and uh, I'm a training coordinator with TechSoup Europe. Uh, I work uh, with TechSoup on various projects supporting civil society in terms of media literacy and uh, ways to stay safe online. Um, TechSoup Europe supports civil society organizations to use the best technology for social change. So uh, if you are looking for uh, software, hardware, tech solutions, training or community to help you deal with digital transformation, I, uh, I do recommend visiting TechSoup Europe's website and just you know, get in touch with us. Uh, hello, Stefan. Stefan is back with us. <laughs> uh, anyway, our today's event is uh, being hosted on the HiveMind platform. Now, HiveMind, uh, it's an initiative supported by TechSoup Europe. It's a, it's a unique online meeting space, gathering activists, trainers, teachers, journalists, CSOs, and uh, practically a wider community interested uh, in learning more about media literacy. Um, we've just uh, pasted links to TechSoup's and HiveMind uh, sites in the chat. So just, you know, follow us and visit us someday. <laughs> okay, back to our event, um, some housekeeping rules. Um, so the event is going to last 60 minutes in total. And in the last 10, 15 minutes, we are going to have a question and answer session with our uh, wonderful presenters. And in order to uh, talk to them, you should uh, paste your comments and your questions into the chat, choosing the to all panelists and attendees option. This way we can see it and we'll be able to pass your questions uh, over to, to our speakers. Uh, of course, it's, it's a webinar format, so it'll be muted and uh, your video, video will be off the whole time. Now, Back to the, uh, the most important part of our event, to our speakers. Today we have with us uh, Dr. Melanie Rebeck and Stefan Marziske of Radically Open Security. Uh, Radically Open Security is the first nonprofit computer security consultancy company in the world. And uh, that it was also named uh, the 50th most innovative SME by the Dutch Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it's, it's a super interesting organization of, uh, of people being really passionate about uh, making the world a safer place. Um, Melanie is uh, the CEO and the co-founder of Radically Open Security. And she's also a TEDx speaker, uh, she's an ethical hacker. She's one of the most successful uh, women in the Netherlands and one of the most inspiring ones in tech. Um, Stefan is a, a free software developer and he's a security expert who cares deeply about human rights in the digital context. And for the last five years, Stef has been uh, working for Radically Open Security as a pen tester and a code auditor. Now, they both have really extensive uh, experience in giving uh, trainings to people uh, all over the globe in terms of operational security. And so this is why we are here today. We are here to listen to Stefan and Melanie and learn from them and become more resilient and secure online. So please welcome Melanie and Stefan. Uh, guys, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, all, right. all right, I'm just gonna start out by uh, sharing my screen uh, so we can see the presentation. So just one moment, uh, I just need to maximize it. All right, you all can see the slides? Yes? Oh, uh, Dominica? 
Okay, well, I will, uh, very good. I will assume you all can see them. So uh, my name is Melanie. I've been in security for about 20 years. And uh, yeah, Steph also uh, has been in working with security and NGOs uh, probably just as long, I think. <laughs> so, and uh, Radically Open Security does a tremendous amount of work with the nonprofit uh, NGO and civil society sector. That's why we're really happy and proud uh, to work together with TechSoup. <laughs> so uh, thank you again uh, also for inviting us. Uh, but we've really worked on quite a large number of uh, cases uh, with civil society. We've been participants in what's called the CVCBR, which is a uh, incident response team uh, for the civil society sector. But we've also worked with uh, uh, everything from, uh, you know, the, the Red Cross uh, to the smallest organizations like little uh, free speech organizations uh, with, from, with Iranian uh, refugees and everything in between. So, you know, we're going to be talking today about operational security, which essentially means, you know, if you are in the nonprofit sector or the civil society sector, how do you make sure that you're not compromised, that, you know, that your security is not compromised of your things on the server side of your devices? How do you make sure that you are uh, not social engineered? And you also need to make sure that uh, you know you do this <laughs> before you need it. So that's really what this presentation today is going to be about. So Steph, do you want to uh, say something about this slide? Um, yeah. Um, well, the most important part about operational security that it's really a, a process that you need to apply, and it has uh, it's not a technical thing at all. So. We're going to show you some steps of that, but uh, the most important is you need to know what your critical assets are. You need to identify uh, your adversaries, your enemies, and what their capabilities are. And you need to know your own vulnerabilities, your own weaknesses. And then based on all this information, you can make an assessment of, uh, of how and what you need to protect. And then you apply these uh, these protections, or as we call them, mitigations. So this is a this is a five-step process that you iterate all the time during your work. And uh, if you do this well, then you will not be um, interrupted in in achieving your goals by your adversaries. Yep, hopefully. <laughs> so. Uh... So basically, one thing that's kind of interesting is it is instructive to look at terrorists. Yes, really, terrorists. The reason why is because they are essentially trying to balance operational security with achieving their own political goals. In that sense, I mean, there's actually not that much difference between, you know, a civil society uh, activist and a terrorist. In fact, many civil society activists are defined as terrorists uh, by, uh, by hostile uh, governments, which basically means that, uh, you know, it provides us with a set ex of examples that are both uh, instructive <laughs> uh, and also so, uh, well, there, there's quite a few battle stories also that we can uh, can enjoy and that we can learn something from. And again, I need to emphasize here that many of these things that are used by spy terrorists and criminal organizations are not technical at all. They're just common sense, natural things that you do uh, in in the in the face of a threat. Um, for example, compartmentalization. You know these old pictures, these posters where say, lose lips, sink ships. This is nothing technical about this, right? And this is an operational security measure that you don't talk to all the people about what is sensitive, right? Yep, indeed. We have to keep in mind that it is much easier to be an attacker than a defender. Just quite simply because when you are a defender, you are fighting against the tide of complexity. Whereas with attackers, then we have to get one small thing right uh, to compromise you. Um, you know, it makes it hard uh, when you're a defender, and it does mean you need to constantly be raising the bar. So as uh, Stefan uh, had said before, it really all starts with uh, identification of your critical assets. If, if I may, uh, a you short need to interjection. ask a question, for example, Yes, go ahead. With the attacker and the defender imbalance, to going back to that, what it really means is that you need to be prepared that you will be owned one way or another. The real question is, how often will you be owned? 
and how badly will you be owned? And the other thing that I wanted to note here is that the attacker and defender role reverses as soon as the attacker is successful because the attacker doesn't want to be noticed. And if you notice as a defender that an attacker has breached you, then you can actually attack and then the roles reverse and then you want to boot him. And uh, so this is, this is not as, it also means that the attackers will be owned because then when the roles reverse, they will also be, become defenders and you become the attackers. So this is something to keep in mind that it's not uh, as asymmetric. It's only asymmetric in the roles, but the roles reverse. And we all will be in both of these roles sooner or later. Okay, sorry. Yeah, no worries, no worries. So it all gets started really with the identification of our critical assets. So you need to ask yourself the question, what are my crown jewels? <laughs> Uh, you know, basically what is important to me. You also need to ask yourself the related question, what are the crown jewels in the eyes of my attacker? <laughs> it could be that uh, the list of the crown jewels is actually not the same. So what I consider to be my crown jewels might not necessarily be the same as what my attacker sees uh, their crown jewels uh, in my infrastructure uh, to be. In the case of NGOs and journalists, uh, it could very well be things like uh, your sources, donors, supporters, uh, different tactical plans uh, that you have. And uh, of course, also all of your IT uh, infrastructure. And, and remember, you really have to focus because if you try protecting everything, you're gonna wind up protecting nothing. <laughs> so you shouldn't necessarily spread all your eggs you know, across multiple baskets, but it's more just sort of like figure out which basket is really the most important and spend you know, your limited resources trying to uh, protect the most important things. So this is also notable here is that when you decide on what to spend your money on or your resources on for defense, your attacker will try to make you A, spend on something that is irrelevant for his attack and B, to overspend, to make you overspend. So you, you're, you're, you're just wasting your resources basically. Um, yeah. Okay. Another thing that's important is minimizing your attack surface because there is a, again, there's this sea of complexity which is making it hard for us. And the more that we can minimize this complexity, uh, then the, the easier it will be to be able to protect things. Uh, you wanna say more about this stuff? Um, well, yeah, this is, this is one of the most fundamental uh, um, security principles or operational security mitigations that you can have. Um, you want to keep you, anything that you work with as simple as possible and you want to understand it and complex system no one can understand. As you know, you don't understand your browser, you don't understand your computer. So, and with all the complexity that these come with, you really want to, to trim down and that also means that you trim down your attack surface. And in the end, if you have only one, and there will be many examples later on where this minimization of attack surface will come back and will show you a good example. And basically that means that very many products that you see coming from the industry, from the IT industry, are actually enlarging your attack surface and are contraproductive when it comes to operational security. Even though many of these products even try to sell you security while in many cases they actually reduce your security. Uh, and I think this is one of the most important uh, uh, sentences here. If you don't understand what is happening, how do you know if it's doing what it should? So if you're not seeing what is happening, and if you're not seeing that this is doing what it should, then you cannot be ever sure that this is, this is what it should be doing. So, and even if you don't understand what your, uh, uh, your system, your own system, you can assume that your attacker will understand your system and they will understand your system better than you do. And this is Shannon's maxim. Um, and for example, my, my favorite example is browsers. We use browsers nowadays for everything, but browsers really are a, a means to externalize the development cost of software onto the user. And the costs that are being externalized are not only monetary, but these are also security costs. And, uh, and a whole bunch of other costs. Um, so, so all the stuff that is being developed in browsers, in JavaScript, is really a liability for you as individuals, as organizations, and for society. 
Okay. Thanks, uh, Steph. Yeah. Um, there are some other uh, principles that we need to keep in mind, like the uh, principle of least privilege. Uh, uh, this is similar to uh, saying complexity things. It's basically that uh, should be given. So in other words, it's kind of like me need to know if uh, if people don't need to know then uh, you know or if they don't need access to such a thing then it reduces your attack surface uh, you know in being able to re reduce this uh, another principle that is quite important is defense in depth uh, which basically means that you need redundant security you need backup so, so basically what that means or I should say backup security mechanisms so if one thing fails you want basically it to not be total loss okay um, Another thing also that I'd like to move on with is the whole concept of uh, Dalton Sparsenkite, which basically just means do not collect more data than you need to do. So what that basically means is what, you know, what is not there cannot be breached. <laughs> you know, it's also sort of similar in spirit uh, to when you think about things like the, uh, the GDPR. <laughs> um, you know, basically, you know, also we're being instructed to minimize the amount of data uh, that we're collecting. Uh, Again, it's also sort of common sense and best practice uh, for security because, you know, if you think about things like uh, bulletproof hosters, uh, uh, which, uh, of course, uh, serve the criminal sector, what they will frequently do is uh, not maintain any logs. So if they're raided by the police, then they can basically throw their hands up and say, sorry, we don't have that data in the first place. But it's not just those on the criminal side that can do this. I mean, those of us also on the legitimate, you know, <laughs> good side uh, should also be uh, be doing this. And uh, this is also another important principle. So the example here on this page is uh, the attachment A is coming from a Sapoena from the US Department of uh, Justice. Uh, Sapoena the data about two uh, phone numbers from Signal, the Signal, the, the chat app. And Signal does not connect any data at all about their users. And uh, the FBI actually wanted to have all the data available about these phone numbers. And you can see all the data that Signal was able to give back as the last connection date and the date when the account was created, nothing else. And so this is really useless uh, for the FBI in uh, um, figuring out anything else about these um, accounts. And so this is a super good example of how you should do this. If you don't need it, don't collect it. Thanks, Steph. Um, next, um, know your enemy. <laughs> um, because if you understand uh, your adversary, then it's going to also help you understand how you need to prioritize your defenses. Because remember, it's, uh, it's easier to attack than to defend. And, and also, especially as relatively small, relatively poorly funded organizations, it means we need to pick and choose about uh, what we can spend our money on. The more we understand the capacity of our attackers and the more we understand our attacker model, in other words, what, what keeps us up at night? You know, we need to be able to answer that question because that will help us prioritize uh, where we want to de basically uh, dedicate our defenses to. Um, another thing also is we had spoken before about uh, intelligence agencies, and it's uh, interesting to know because, of course, a, a number of civil society groups do have nation states and intelligence agencies uh, as part of your attack model. There are open source intelligence sources where you can actually find quite interesting information up on their capabilities and also on the tools uh, that they use. So things like uh, various uh, tendering documents, uh, leaks, uh, such as the Vault 7 or spy files, a series from WikiLeaks, the NSA's Ant Catalog. Citizen Lab is amazing. <laughs> uh, they're constantly reverse engineering all kinds of um, basically state-sponsored malware and these kinds of surveillance tools. And uh, you know, if you wanna know more, there's super resource. Uh, bugplanet.info, and of course, also uh, Bellingcat. And Bellingcat is really fantastic also for uh, teaching you how to use open source intelligence uh, sources. 
There's also some uh, recommended reading uh, here also just in general on these intelligence agencies and spycraft. Uh, some bits of it uh, will probably be more relevant to your attacker model than other bits, but nonetheless, uh, these are just a few tips uh, for if you have some free time and you want to read some things that are interesting. Uh, the Grug uh, has a, a blog with a lot of information. Also, um, Tara And super good case studies. Yeah, exactly. And we can, by the way, give a copy of these slides uh, to Dominica. So if you want to have these uh, uh, lists after the fact, we can get this to you. These are clickable links in the PDF, actually. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, we're going to move on and talk about uh, common attacks on NGOs and journalists. And uh, we're going to start out by thinking about uh, basically discrediting <laughs> People. So in other words, uh, you, your reputation could be attacked. There could be uh, fake news, basically, that's, uh, that's being spread about you. And uh, again, you know, this is sort of also a bit of uh, spycraft uh, kinds of techniques. So um, anyway, oh, uh, additionally, uh, a kind of unlikely battleground that uh, is also taking place is Wikipedia. <laughs> so um, it's really odd. Uh, you wouldn't think it, but there's actually a, a battle uh, for uh, controlling the spin, <laughs> you know, of, uh, on, on information uh, that's playing out on a regular basis on Wikipedia. And if you were to look at you know, basically any kinds of Wikipedia pages of uh, movements that are the least bit controversial <laughs> or that have uh, you know, uh, institutional opponents or these kinds of things. If you look at the edit logs, you'll see quite a bit of, uh, um, yeah, I mean, edits going back and forth because of course so many people nowadays sort of consider Wikipedia to be the, uh, the objective truth, <laughs> you know, and this has had also real world uh, consequences. Um, oh, Steph, uh, by the way, I think you're muted. Either stuff. Hello. Okay. Anyway, but uh, so yeah. So basically, uh, there are uh, there's actually a, a German documentary that provides more information about this, uh, talking about the dark side of Wikipedia. So this is really interesting. Um. Another thing also is uh, deep fakes. <laughs> so talking about information warfare and uh, people that are uh, trying to discredit you, um, basically you can create using artificial intelligence really convincing, uh, well, basically sort of replicas <laughs> uh, of people. And uh, this can happen both with, uh, with voice as well as with video. <laughs> and it's, it's pretty convincing. The way to get around these deep fakes is to use what's called liveness checking. <laughs> and uh, liveness checking is basically used to uh, verify any kinds of, uh, well, check the liveness of any kinds of biometrics. This also works for things like uh, fingerprints and uh, iris scans, just to make sure that people are not giving you, um, oh, but, by the way, Steph, could you go somewhere a little less noisy? <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, so, uh, but the idea is that uh, if uh, I want, uh, so somebody is basically presenting a video and then this video is, uh, you know, I wanna make sure that it's not a deep fake. What you can do is you can actually ask them, for example, to sit in a, in a swivel chair and just turn around <laughs> in these kinds of things. Or you can ask uh, certain questions and then, uh, you know, get, get answers basically really quickly. It's really difficult uh, for AI programs to be able to respond this quickly. So, uh, so, so this kind of liveness checking is really great for uh, countering deep fakes. Uh, phishing, of course, is another one of these uh, topics. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, you know, the human, well, the human is always the weakest link and it's 
incredibly easy uh, for someone to just send you, you know, the, the phishing mail or with the attachment, with that link uh, that you click on, um, you know, otherwise send you that, you, you drop that USB stick on the ground that you plug into your machine. And if you can't find sort of a technical entrance into uh, somebody's infrastructure, do you basically, you know, doing it with phishing, uh, compromising this human factor is always a really easy way uh, to attack people. Uh, do be aware that uh, things like uh, two-factor uh, authentication are really excellent at uh, providing extra layers uh, of security against phishing. Um, also, do keep in mind that uh, devices are listening to you, uh, you know, and they're tracking you. Certainly, in the case of criminals, uh, you know it's it's fairly trivial. You know, if you uh, have even the even if the phone is turned off, if you still have the battery in your phone, uh, you know they can still be triangulated uh, within cells, and and police use this all the time to find criminals. <laughs> so, uh, but do bear in mind, you know, the definition of criminal tends to vary from uh, from place to place. Uh, some people think Greenpeace is a criminal. I would disagree, but uh, <laughs> you know, but in either case, um, do be aware that uh, keeping your devices about you uh, is, is risky uh, because the webcams can be compromised, the microphones can be compromised. Uh, there's been certainly cases of uh, smart television sets, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, also spying. Uh, basically, any kind of IoT device that has uh, <laughs> that has sensors uh, can be used for, 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 for basically for surveillance of some kind. So just do be aware uh, of this. Um, all right, so uh, another thing also is that uh, we like to chat with each other. <laughs> and certainly if we're activists, you know, we will probably be trying to coordinate amongst ourselves to do uh, different kinds of uh, activistic actions. Um, we use chat programs, whether it's Signal or WhatsApp or Omemo or you know, Facebook Messenger or whatever. Um, the point is that uh, we should rely on end-to-end -end, uh, encryption. <laughs> but when we start getting into scenarios where we have group chat, um, because you know there's there's sort of no longer <laughs> quite as strictly end to end. You're weakening the protocol uh, to the extent that it can leak um, some well, basically information more easily. Uh, Seth, want yeah. to add something? Yeah. So this is actually a thing. Um, um, any any protocol or any app that allows you to use multiple devices with the same account or even worse, doing group chatting is has much lower security guarantees than a one-on-one -on -one chat where you where there's only two peers allowed in a chat, and um, and this is being abused. This has been proposed a few years back, and it's being abused by or or used depending on your view, of course, by law enforcement agencies all over the world. So even the German BKA, the the Bundeskriminalamt, is able to listen into WhatsApp uh, communications between people, even though WhatsApp itself is what everyone is looking for end-to-end -end encrypted. And yet, during this kind of ghosting, um, um, they are able even, I mean, it's just a criminal, uh, it's just the cops, it's not really spies. Yeah. Uh, Signal has the same, there's a question in this chat. Signal is also able to handle multiple devices and handle multi uh, uh, group chat. So uh, with Signal, this is exactly the same case. Uh, an organization, law enforcement probably, will be able to add an extra device to your account and uh, they will be able to listen into this. Uh, actually, there's a link in the bottom which also shows the, the problem with signal. This is the, um, the, the footnote number eight. If you read that, you can read more on this, just, just to the answer the question in the chat. Um, um, that's it. Uh, the PDF will be published later and then you can just click on it. Answering the answer, the question in the chat. So uh, all of these chat applications that we're using, they are, um, available um, to be ghosted, really, because people expect to be able to use multiple devices, their phones, their laptops, their tablets, 
and people want to do group messaging. And uh, you know, if you have big groups, like even just a few dozen people, how do you know that not one of those dozen people is copying out all this data itself? Or how do you guarantee that uh, all of them are allegedly in there? And uh, you know, and even in the worst case, if um, I mean, you have a tightly knit group and all of them are uh, trusted by you, how do you know that one of them is not turned by the cops, uh, which happens all the time, or um, or one of them um, is actually arrested without you knowing it, and their device is in the control of uh, uh, law enforcement. Or for example, when you pass through a security gate at the airport, when they take away your devices or it runs through, there is devices, if you really want to backdoor a device, you can uh, easily have physical access for just half a minute and uh, add a new user, for example, auto in an automated fashion. and. And from then on, you're owned. Yeah. yeah. OK. Uh, another thing also that you have to bear in mind is with uh, plain text logs. <laughs> uh, just because your chat app is end-to-end uh, -end encrypted, <laughs> that won't necessarily help you if you have uh, clear text logging uh, turned on. And here's uh, a screen text uh, which shows um, in audio. a particular case. This is audio. audio. This is a an Apple uh, chat program that does OTR chat. Um, yeah. But it, again, here also, which goes back to one thing that we said in the beginning with the Datensparsamkeit, that uh, self-destroying messages are a good thing because those messages don't exist anymore if, if they are trustable that actually they do self-destroy themselves. So instead of logging everything, you should destroy everything. Yeah? Leave no trace. Yeah, agreed. All right, uh, there's also uh, what we call evil made attacks. <laughs> and basically, if like, let's say you are uh, going to a conference and uh, you go to a uh, hotel, and uh, let's say that you want to do something along the lines of uh, go out for a run or perhaps uh, yeah, go, go use the hotel sauna, <laughs> uh, you know, you, people might be inclined to leave their devices uh, in the hotel room. Uh, or otherwise to leave the devices in the safe in the hotel room. Do bear in mind that both the rooms as well as the safes are extremely trivially <laughs> broken into, which, and you know, and this is a, a pretty frequent uh, scenario for how um, people are, uh, are, are compromised. So if you can, if you're in a location that you don't trust, uh, try and keep your devices with you at all times. I know that it's inconvenient and obviously it's not gonna work for something like a sauna, but uh, you know, it's, uh, we, we have to do our best with this. I would even go further, even in places where you trust that it's, uh, where, you, where you don't expect an attack, you should always keep your physical uh, proximity to your devices. So you, however nice it looks, don't go to the sauna and don't leave your stuff upstairs. Well, um, it's really not worth it. Okay. Um, next, we're gonna talk about uh, biometrics. Um, be aware that it is uh, in many cases pretty easy uh, to copy uh, biometrics uh, or otherwise to, uh, to falsify them. Um, you know, it's uh, there's a, a number of hackers uh, that specialize in uh, in biometric hacking. I believe it was uh, it was a friend of yours, uh, Steph, that took this photograph. Yes, actually, it's a colleague of us. This yes, is, it is a colleague uh, of ours. <laughs> he works rarely because there's it's a very special uh, expertise that he has, but he, he nevertheless works for Radical Open Security, and he's the expert who re recovered fingerprints about eight years ago from a picture of uh, Angela Merkel's hands while she was gesturing. And he was uh, doing the unlocking of iPhones, of Android phones with iris, with face scanning and all these other things. He's like the expert. And um, the techniques that he develops are going over to the, to the law enforcement agencies. And so they're also being deployed there. And uh, let's not forget that uh, even even if they don't need to use these uh, technologies. In many places, it might be illegal to arrest you and then take your finger and push it onto the phone to unlock the phone. But uh, 
I mean, this happens all the time that uh, these laws are not obeyed by by the keepers of the law. And so it happens all the time. For example, in Finland, it is even legal to, to use your biometrics against you. In the US, it is not, but still it happens despite it not being legal. So you biometrics are not a good protection for sensitive data at all. And they're worse than that, actually. And that's the next slide. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, yeah, and, and photographs are, are another one of these things uh, that you have to be really careful about. Uh, there's an, a kind of funny story from uh, one of the Dutch uh, hacker camps uh, from, uh, well, probably at least a decade ago at this, at this point. But uh, some, uh, some, ha some hackers from the group called uh, Tool, which is a lockpicking association, had actually made uh, a photograph of uh, the keys uh, to a police's uh, pair of handcuffs. <laughs> and uh, they took that photograph, uh, went, went, went off, uh, came back uh, the next day, and uh, went up to the cop and opened his handcuffs. Uh, they were, of course, uh, doing this to make a point, but it's uh, equally uh, easy to do these kinds of things with pictures of your biometrics. You can see, for example, here this, uh, this picture uh, with this uh, mature blue stilton. Um, and uh, yeah, based upon such a a photograph, uh, there are techniques to be able to make uh, make physical copies. So if you are um, taking photographs of things, <laughs> uh, try if you can to obscure the uh, biometrics that are in the photos. You can do this without reducing image quality too much, <laughs> or at least uh, you know, for the parts of the photo that you actually do want people to look at. It's also very similar when taking photographs and putting things on uh, social media. People do really silly things like, uh, like, look, I just got the keys to my new apartment, you know, photo, or like, look, I just got my new credit card, uh, you know, or like, look, I just got my new, you know, uh, passport or uh, driver's license or, you know, use common sense with this kind of stuff. Uh, you can blur this out and uh, there's no reason why you should be putting this kind of stuff online anyway. There's two links on this page, the, the Fox and the Loki. These are both uh, online uh, university academic uh, services where you can actually upload your uh, pictures and it will distort the pictures in a way that for a human it's non-recognizable at all. So you don't recognize that there's any distortion in it. But uh, facial recognition will fail to identify your picture or your, your you on the picture correctly. And that is something really uh, awesome and that should be used uh, as much as possible when you, you shouldn't be sharing pictures at all in the first place. But if you have to, like a group picture or something of your company, employees and about or team page or something, then you should uh, apply these uh, um, um, programs to, to protect them from facial recognition algorithms. Great. Um, next, we're going to go back uh, to the topic again of chat apps. <laughs> uh, they're not all equal. Uh, and, uh, you know, depending on your attacker model, you may or may not want to use one that's owned by Facebook, <laughs> just saying. Um, some of the more popular secure uh, chat apps, of course, Signal uh, is, is the most obvious one. Um, there was a, a short debate about uh, how open the source was, but it seems that that debate has gotten uh, resolved. Um, you know, there used to be, uh, well, I mean, Wire used to be in Switzerland, but recently moved to the U.S. So that also changed its, uh, its threat model. So, uh, so uh, behave accordingly. Uh, Telegram, uh, you know, think about your relationship with the Russians when deciding whether or not to use that one. With Telegram, there's uh, also the, the really strange crypto that they're using. They're doing stuff that no real cryptographer uh, that is trained in this art would consider as sane. So, and uh, Telegram does no encryption by default and it's quite, quite difficult to actually do so. Really, um, you shouldn't be using Telegram if it's not uh, really necessary. It's a, it's, I think it's really a brilliant honey trap, really. Think more mm -hmm. in the, it, it reminds me of Crypto AG, the Swiss company that was selling encryption hardware all over the world and, uh, just last year, uh, it, we had more evidence that it was all um, compromised from the start by the CIA and the BND. Yeah. 
Um, be careful of anything implemented in JavaScript. Uh, this is a recently, this is, this is a, a theme that we keep coming back. And there's also a few other uh, options like uh, off the record version four, as well as uh, Briar and Tinfoil chat. Yeah, Briar is a really uh, mature tool and it is also an, um, an kind of off the grid thing. So it does also do messaging via Bluetooth that is very useful in demonstrations, for example. Uh, avoiding the telecommunications infrastructure. Uh, I can warmly recommend Briar, really. Um, it is a, it is a, a well-designed tool, uh, and I know actually the, the authors. Uh, and Tinfoil Chat is really, the name is program, so it really, Tinfoil Chat is really for those who really, really, really have to um, secure their um, communications. Um, I, would, I would say, for example, Julian Assange would be a prime user of this um, if he would be free. Um, it really is about um, um, having three computers, one computer where you compose your messages, one computer where you read your messages, and one computer that is connected to the network. And um, so this is a really nice compartmentalization concept. I, I think it's a bit maybe too expensive for um, you people here. But uh, if you are in this thread model, then do consider Tinfojet. It's an awesome solution. The question was here in the chat also about wire again. Uh, wire is uh, is basically equivalent to Signal. There's one. There's two big. Well, there's one big difference. The big difference is that Signal still requires phone numbers, so only people with SIM cards and phone numbers can use Signal. Where Wire uh, allows any kind of uh, uh, username that you can just choose for yourself. And so this is this is this is a cool feature. I also know that Wire was developed in uh, in Berlin, so it's German people, and they use the same protocol, the Signal protocol that Signal also uses. So on this uh, on the on the technical side, they are more or less equivalent. Uh, on the usability side, the difference is really I need a phone or I don't need a phone. But then Wire is also um, of course, running on a phone, and most people will be using it on a phone, so this is kind of irrelevant for people. But uh, the different thing here is um, that uh, Wire was a German Swiss uh, company, but they actually had uh, created a Delaware company that is now owning uh, Wire, and so that uh, opens them up to the US legal system. So if if you do anything that is against US interests, uh, you might not want to use Wire either, but that is true for Signal as well, right? But then um, with Signal, we see Signal is not really collecting much data, but uh, as it, when it comes to ghosting, Signal and Wire are, are also equivalent. Yeah. All right. Well, what's uh... up data privacy for? Oh is really about uh, Facebook connecting the data with WhatsApp uh, information, like who you chat with, how you chat with, how often you chat with, and stuff like this. Yes, I would say don't use Facebook features. Any Facebook product, Instagram, WhatsApp, Facebook, you should avoid them all. Uh, so Because it's all just one big kraken, and it just siphons all your data, and uh, you are not going to profit from that. Uh, I know there's a lot of people FOMOing, fearing uh, of missing out, but there's really, you shouldn't be fearing that. Just don't uh, succumb to the to the crack and, and don't use Facebook uh, feature uh, products. Well, once again, I think I, I, I'll nuance that a little bit by saying it depends on your attacker model. <laughs> but, uh... But yeah. Well, this is not really an attacker model. This is really, you're sacrificing not only your own privacy by creating these network effects, you also sacrifice the privacy of those people who are not using that because there's this pressure and there's this like, hey, you're not on Facebook, you're not on WhatsApp. Uh, and this, this, this really creates um, also vulnerabilities to, for those people who are not using this. Just say no. And it's a decentralization thing also. Okay, um, we're gonna move on uh, to TOR. So TOR uh, stands for the Onion Router. It is a uh, product that is used for uh, protecting your anonymity by basically going through multiple layers of uh, proxies, uh, basically uh, every time with a different circuit. Uh, be aware that TOR is a double-edged sword. 
Um, at least uh, over 25% of the exit nodes uh, of Tor are known to be actively malicious and probably some significant percentage beyond that are owned by law enforcement, <laughs> which basically means, uh, you know, it, it's all great uh, with, uh, you know, the fact that uh, uh, you, you've got encrypted communications, but if the endpoint is able to read it, then you still need to be extremely careful about what you're sending through there and you also need to make sure that you're using additional layers of end-to-end uh, -end encryption uh, on top of that. So there's also uh, plenty of attacks that have been de uh, demonstrated against uh, the Tor network, uh, de-anonymization attacks. Certainly if you are running, uh, usually they're, they're like browser-based attacks. Uh, avoid using really buggy complex software and anything using JavaScript uh, because that is a really easy way of being able to uh, sort of uh, deliver additional information sort of outside uh, of, uh, of uh, the Tor system and also uh, be careful with using it against the five eyes uh, just because uh, being aware that they also own a significant percentage of the exit nodes. Oh, and by the way, the hidden services also face the same classes of attacks as the uh, uh, clients, the web clients do. So. Another tool uh, that we're going to talk about is PGP, uh, email encryption. Uh, you know, it's uh, generally a good thing to do. But, <laughs> big but, uh, it also is not as good as you think it is. <laughs> and it, worse yet, can even give you a false sense of security. The problems uh, with PGP is uh, really, you know, it, this communications is only as secure as, as you sort of trust that the, the public key that you're using <laughs> uh, actually belongs to the person that you think it does. And you know, un unless uh, you've been doing a whole bunch of key signing parties, <laughs> um, you know, which of course you know is sort of a geek right of right right of passage for people like me and Steph. But you know, if you haven't been through, through key signing parties, then essentially it's really hard, uh, you know, without any other out of band channels to be able to validate. Uh, it, I mean, somebody uploaded the key, and, and that somebody is claiming to be a certain person, you know, with that certain email address. But is it really that person? I mean, you don't know for sure. Anyone can. Um, uh, upload a key for a certain person's email address, you know, to the key servers. And, uh, you know, also many, uh, you know, PGP uh, clients also automatically retrieve uh, these keys from the servers, <laughs> uh, sometimes by default, even without it's asking you, which essentially, again, is sort of putting trust, you know, and, and again, really, this is only as secure as the amount of trust that you put in, into the whole web of trust that's behind it. So with PGP, the thing is really that it's a, it's a tool that comes from the 90s. And I think uh, as a political weapon, it was much more important in getting cryptography out to the people than actually providing security. And it's really, it's, we don't have anything else. Uh, and it's really horrible. It's really difficult to use for normal people. Even for people who have a clue, it's really difficult to use. It's like a Swiss army knife, but you will always cut your finger with it. And, uh, we, but it's marginally better than not encrypting at all. But really, the first thing, if you have an attacker that is compromising your computer is and you have PGP and the attacker knows that, they are going to go for your PGP keys and then they can read all your emails from the past that they ever seen. And they can also see, uh, read all your emails from the future that you see. So this is really, um, really only do it if you have to. You will no, not find really anyone on the internet uh, a crypt, uh, from the cryptography uh, department that will recommend you to use PGP. And I cannot really uh, do that either, that you can use instead of PGP. There's SMIME. Uh, which is like this industrial standard. This you can use if you're in, an, in a big organization, in a big company, like for example, um, if you work for, for Microsoft, IBM, Siemens, Philips, where you have hundreds of thousands of people working in the company, then you can use SMIME, but this SMIME only works really inside the company for outside communication, it doesn't really work. So email is really, it should be dead, and I think it is dead, but it's going to haunt us for many, many decades more until we get rid of email. Um, we, are, we are just stuck with this thing, and uh, it's really sticking to our, our boot, and we should scrape it off. But it's really difficult to do. I'm sorry. 
I'm a, I'm a bit less I'm a bit less cynical than Steph, but uh, nonetheless, uh, I, I would say, look, defense in depth. I mean, I, I think it's better to use it than not to use it. <laughs> I mean, for for the marginal gains that it'll you know give you and preventing right. whoever's on the network from being able to 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 you know, I mean, be able to sniff the year. If you need to message. We just don't have unrealistic expectations. If you if you need to message things, then I would rather go with Signal than with PGP. If you have to share files, then I would rather go with Magic Wormhole than with PGP. If you have to sign things, maybe use PGP. That's that's a thing. And and PGP signatures are pretty good protections against phishing attempts, uh, email phishing attempts, for example. That's a that's a cool thing actually. But uh, even that is, um, yeah. Okay, yeah. we're going to move on uh, to browsers. Uh, so basically, uh, browsers are huge and complicated and buggy and have a really large attack surface. So in general, I mean, anything that is browser based, you should be extremely suspicious about it. Um, you should be even more suspicious if there's all kinds of uh, plugins and extensions, because all of this is also uh, continuing to increase your attack surface. In general, uh, the less you're able to do, so, do with something, the more that uh, a piece of software is sort of dedicated to one single function. Uh, in other words, the less useful it is, the less functional it is, probably the more secure it's going to be. And that's sort of like one of the, why one of the keys to protecting yourselves with web browsers is just quite simply to try and deactivate as much of the dynamic functionality as possible. And there are tools uh, like NoScript, uh, you know, but also this, uh, you know, Link, Link Cleaner and some of these others that will help you to achieve that. Yeah, and uh, here I want to note that uh, from a security point of view, the best browsers are Chrome-based browsers, but of course they violate your privacy. At least Google is trying really hard to do so uh, via the browsers. Um, Brave tries to mitigate this, uh, being a privacy-respecting pr browser based on Chrome. So you have kind of the, the security of Chrome but not quite because they're always lagging behind what Chrome is already fixing in security bugs. Brave will be a few days or maybe even a few weeks behind that. And also uh, Google has this super good security team, which Brave doesn't have uh, and the money behind that. So, but Brave is better in, in protecting your privacy. And if you're using a latest updated Windows version, uh, Edge is now also based on Chrome and Edge has some really awesome but only in the latest version, has some really awesome features that uh, make it actually better than, um, than the Google Chrome-based browsers. And of course, Firefox is somewhere in the middle. From a security point of view, it's not as strong as the Chrome-based browsers, but from a privacy point of view, it's, uh, it's uh, maybe better than uh, the rest of these. Yeah. Um, yeah. But really, oh, what I wanted also to say that even if something doesn't run in a, in a browser, many times uh, applications are developed as Electron apps. And Electron is a framework from Facebook, which is basically a really old Chrome browser. And they just run their application in this old Chrome browser. And the security of these apps is abysmal and they should be as far as avoided as possible. For example, Signal Desktop is also an Electron app. And the security of that is much less than your Chrome browser that is updated to the latest version. So um, I would, that's about that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We're going to move on to the topic of uh, password managers. Uh, we are lazy as people, and we have bad memories too. So this is why we choose bad passwords. We choose ones that are easy to remember, uh, and then we reuse them all over the place. And uh, you know, precisely the fact that uh, they're simple enough and reused enough that we can remember them are why they are easy for attackers to be able to crack. Uh, you can use password managers, uh, but be aware that those are also a double-edged sword. <laughs> um, what I mean, basically, what it is is it can actually handle things like password generation, password management, password resets for you. That's fantastic. All you need to do is 
is, you know, one login to, to, to log into the, you know, the, the vault to be able to get access to all those passwords. But it's that single login, you know, that is also the weakness of these password managers. So basically, you know, what this means is that, uh, you know, it just takes one compromise and then the attacker has access to all of your passwords. Or it just takes one moment of neglectfulness to actually be able to lose access, you know, basically lose that password uh, to your uh, password vault, and then you no longer can get access to those passwords uh, that are in the password manager. Of course, you can bypass all of this anyways, uh, just by password resets. <laughs> so, I mean, for me personally, I just prefer to, uh, you know, uh, well, you can skip the vault and basically just, uh, you know, auto create uh, really complicated passwords that you're never going to remember. Don't reuse them. And just if you, uh, at a certain point, you have to log in a second time, just do a password reset, uh, you know, at the, at an email uh, address uh, that's well protected. I mean, uh, that, that's a technique that I like using. Okay. There was two questions in the chat. One is about how about DocuSign for e-signatures? Is it safe? I don't know personally DocuSign. I know it's a PKI based solution. It's a European Union AIDAS uh, um, implementation really. Uh, and as such, it's, uh, I guess it's, uh, it's a traditional thing uh, and uh, these laws are not quite up to date, but I think it's, it's reasonable for what people use it for re most of the time, but I, I don't know really much about this. The second question is Dashlane a secure password manager and this fits very well to this topic. Uh, I would say no. Any password manager that integrates into your browser is easy also to impersonate so that make, can be look like Dashlane is asking for your master password so you can log in somewhere. Uh, and so you just give up your master password. And that is something that you don't want at all. You, when you use a password manager, always use a password manager that is separate from your browser or the only, other, the only exceptions that I can imagine, use the password manager that is in your browser. Because all of your browsers have a password manager and they have uh, visible user interface guarantees that cannot be emulated by a malicious web page that tries to get your master password. Um, basically, it's the, the, the pop-up that comes up. You can easily code a pop-up that looks like the Dashlane pop-up and it's not. Well, you, it's not uh, possible in many cases um, to actually do the same pop-up that uh, your browser does when, it, when you use the browser password manager. That is an exception. But even that is not completely true because browsers also have this feature that is called full screen view. For example, when you want to watch videos, uh, using that feature, it is possible to just overlay the whole uh, browser and it makes you can, a malicious application is able to pop up a window that looks like a, a valid browser window while it is not. So the full screen screen feature in browsers, if you are handling sensitive data should be disabled. Otherwise it is possible to do very um, convincing phishing websites that can even impersonate your operating system windows. Um, so uh, in general, avoid uh, password managers that integrate into your browser. That is my recommendation. Okay. Um, I think that we are going to move on. We're going to have to go through the last few bits just a bit quickly because we're in the last couple of minutes. Um, Two-factor uh, in either case is something that you should always be using <laughs> uh, just because uh, passwords can be cracked and then having two-factor is a good backup. Bearing in mind that, you know, a, a second factor isn't a second factor if it's embedded in the same device as the first factor, uh, but also that uh, if you're using a separate hardware token, if you lose this, that can potentially uh, hinder your access uh, for getting back uh, into your uh, into your accounts again. Uh, VPNs are also a great idea. Idea, uh, because the untrusted Wi-Fi is a thing, especially if you're traveling or you're at conferences or uh, you're on any at, at a train station or any form of Wi-Fi you don't understand. I recommend you get a Wi-Fi pineapple <laughs> and uh, play around with it. It's a script kitty tool for uh, exploiting untrusted Wi-Fi, and it'll allow you to see exactly how easy it is to attack uh, untrusted Wi-Fi. But uh, generally, VPN is a good solution for this. It doesn't have to cost a whole lot of money. Uh, you can set up open VPN, uh, you know, and uh, 
you know, clients uh, like a wire guard uh, for your uh, devices and you'll get a long way without spending much money. Antivirus is a <laughs> double-edged sword. Uh, if you're completely tech illiterate, it could help you to raise the bar, but uh, it's also a really fantastic backdoor. <laughs> and there's been cases uh, of uh, antivirus, especially Kaspersky, <laughs> uh, getting uh, compromised. And uh, of course, that's a really easy way to get access to a bunch of machines at one time. So, you know, it could help in terms of defense and depth, depth but do understand it's increasing your attack surface. Uh, backups, do it. Uh, we have to deal with things like uh, ransomware. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you have backups, it'll, it, it's a lot better than paying the ransom. Also make sure that you try actually restoring these backups and test that before you're actually compromised. Uh, this will save your butt if it is in the fire at a certain point. And don't have um, your uh, decryption key for your backups ransomed because that really sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, let's see, so uh, three more slides. Uh, so operating systems, uh, be aware that there are some operating systems you can use that uh, you can live boot from, uh, like uh, things like Tails, for example, that uh, have uh, full Tor integration and also lock things down to a certain extent. There's also cubes, uh, which you can use to uh, really compartmentalize uh, different operating, uh, operating systems into different virtual machines uh, on your uh, machine. Yes. And I would recommend you to, if you if you use Microsoft products, use the latest Windows 10 with all the latest uh, updates and security patches because uh, Microsoft has been bashed over the last uh, one and a half, two decades so much that they actually have a very strong security uh, development process. And on the other hand, uh, Apple is really, really bad because they try to lock down any kind of security research on their products. So there's very little security research and that uh, is not good for actually for the security of the product. It's only bad for for researchers to, to research, but in the end attackers will have their uh, um, exploits for Apple. So, and of course you can always use some recent Linux, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Content management systems, uh, try and use statically compiled if possible. So things like uh, Jekyll, uh, Pelican is also another good one if you're doing some blogging. Try and avoid uh, plugins and modules. Uh, try and avoid WordPress, please. <laughs> you Andrew know, we, we, we run. Yeah, Andrew Paul, indeed. Uh, we, we, we run into these things all the time during pen tests and it never ends well. Um, also, you know, keep those things automatically updated if you absolutely insist on using them. Uh, avoid anything with JavaScript. We've said this before. And also be careful with the certificate management. It's better to use uh, Let's Encrypt than uh, certificates which are self-signed uh, because in that case, you're also uh, teaching bad habits uh, to your users and uh, also make updates. So uh, Canaries is uh, the last, uh, I think, concrete uh, tip that we're going to give you uh, for this presentation. There's this thing called uh, data <laughs> leakage uh, protection, DLP. And there are these uh, tokens which you would not ordinarily be seeing or using uh, in your network or on hosts, but you can basically use them as de little detectable tokens that if you see one suddenly going across your network, then you know something is, uh, is not entirely correct. So it's sort of like that canary in the coal mine that's letting you know that uh, something is uh, being exfiltrated from your network that shouldn't be. Um, last slide. Uh, so there are all kinds of great resources Courses uh, that are out there that you should look at. Uh, the uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, has quite a number of great resources and great tools uh, on their webpage you should look at. Uh, Totem also uh, has a number of online trainings, <laughs> uh, which are great. So basically in, the, in MOOC form uh, that you can look at. Uh, GCA Toolkit, Fix Your Privacy, that one's in Dutch, uh, Security in a Box, uh, uh, Tactical Tech, I think, Steph, you used to work for Tactical Tech. Yes, um, I was also involved in, the, in some chapters of Security in a Box, and mm -hmm. uh, Totem Project has actually grown up of, out of one of my projects, and then uh, they expanded on that in a more traditional e-learning way than what I was doing. And uh, from all of these, the best I can recommend you is actually SSD from the EFD, EFF. This is a really awesome and uh, 
very well written guide. The others are also super good. I would warmly recommend all of them, but if you only have time for one, do the first one. Great. And another comment that we want to make is we gave uh, Dominica a copy of uh, a uh, operational security guide uh, that we put together at uh, Radically Open Security. It's open sourced, and we also have uh, quite a number of the things we discussed today uh, also mentioned in that guide. Uh, Dominica can uh, distribute that to you. It's also available uh, on GitHub uh, with an open source license. So we uh, hardly also uh, welcome you to, uh, to read that. So you'll all be receiving a copy of these slides and the OPSEC manual and for the rest. If you have any questions whatsoever, we are more than happy uh, to spend the time talking to you. It's also worthwhile saying that we actually do work on a not-for-profit basis. This is part of our nonprofit business model with Radically Open Security. And we also work at cost price for nonprofits NGOs and civil society. So any of you though that need help, but you don't have much budgets, uh, we're anyway happy to talk with you. Uh, so I guess that's about it. Wow, Melanie, Steph, thank you so much. Uh, it's been so rich, so interesting and so useful. Uh, we went a little bit over time, but I'm just curious because we have this like one super uh, question in the chat. Do you think we could spare three minutes more of your time and just answer it? Of course. Uh, Thank you. It's a, a question uh, from one of our participants. How to start working on cybersecurity uh, of your NGOs? What should I do at, at first? And uh, are there any tips how to actually start? Maybe there are some links you could share with us. This is the question. Sure. So uh, actually, Steph, do you want to answer this one? Yes. Uh, so from my perspective, uh, actually, I prepared a when I prepared for this uh, presentation, I prepared a bit longer presentation, which actually gives you uh, answers to these, these questions. And uh, the answer to that is A, uh, implement uh, this OPSEC process where you have these five steps of identifying your critical assets, uh, uh, modeling your adversaries uh, and uh, identifying your own weaknesses and vulnerabilities, and then uh, in the fourth step, make a risk assessment of all of these. And based on this risk assessment, then implement mitigations in the last step and uh, uh, execute this process uh, iteratively. Uh, this is one, my first, uh, and this is a, a very generic process, of course, but uh, this is this is what you need to do. And uh, on the uh, my second recommendations, uh, which is not in this slide, but uh, maybe we can actually share my full slide deck instead of the shortened slide deck. There is also a section on security principles. And I have a list of 14 security principles that are actually, or operational security principles. Again, they are not very technical, but of course they can also be applied on the technical, but also on the human level. And if you apply these uh, uh, 14 principles, uh, then you are on uh, in tandem with the process then you uh, are on a good way to actually increase your security posture um, in general. Um, but uh, I'm sorry, in 45 minutes that we were planning to do here, this is not possible to present all of this in once and also be entertaining but, but and not uh, super boring. Yeah, but that, that's fine. We can basically pass the longer deck uh, also on to all of you. The other thing just to keep in mind is, uh, understand that you won't know how to defend yourself until you know how to attack yourself. <laughs> so there's also uh, certainly quite a number of uh, resources out there. You know, try learning how to run a few scanning tools uh, on yourself. Also, again, if you need any guidance with this, don't hesitate, uh, you know, to send an email, uh, info at radicallyopensecurity.com. And, and certainly just, you know, for free, we're friendly. You know, we're also very happy to sort of point you uh, in the right direction, so. Brilliant, thank you so much. And uh, all the materials will be shared uh, after the presentation. We will also uh, share the, the operational security guide uh, that Melanie mentioned, and you will find all the tips and tricks there. And the recording of the session will be also shared with all of you. 
So once again, uh, thank you so much for participating, for being here with us and uh, check out our website, the HiveMind platform, TechSoup Europe Facebook page, website, because there are more interesting events coming for our community. So thank you once again, have a lovely day and stay safe. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> have a great day.